Hey world, Dan Brown here. Welcome to another edition of Tech Deck Deck Tech, the only EDH deck building show with a, a finger skateboard. <laughs> this is the fourth Tech Deck Deck Tech I've made about this particular EDH deck, and maybe that seems insane to you, but like, you're all EDH players. You know what it's like to have a favorite, right? A deck that you think particularly defines who you are as a player, and that is, you know, unique, distinct, something that you personally created. That's one of the marvels of the singleton format that we play. So yeah, this is a progression of the deck I I featured last time, but there are a few big changes. The first being that today we are talking, in fact, not about Chromat, but Progena Giggles. The first version of this deck was a Chromat build that uh, was based on the Ravnica Karoos, the bounce lands that tap for, you know, two mana rather than one, and mana dorks that untap lands. So basically, um, th this is still a feature of the current version of the deck. I, I call it multiplicative ramp rather than additive ramp. I can talk about that more in the future, but basically it allows us to ramp exponentially rather than linearly um, and do crazy big things way sooner than opponents would expect us to be able to. Um, but that version was still, you know, a little janky, a little fun, doing value plays, but nothing too serious. Then I went to Gen Con last year. It's the largest gaming convention in the country, and I, I, I turned the deck into a pretty brutal combo build that took full advantage of the partial Paris mulligan, right? We weren't just mulliganing to fix our mana, we were also mulliganing, um, holding on to particular combo pieces to try to close out the game before our opponents had even really gotten their uh, bearings, and it worked very well. Well, um, I went 8 and 0 oh at last year's Gen Con between that and my uh, Crufix build. Um, but as we all know, the partial Paris mulligan is no more, and no good, so I put it on the back burner. You know, if the problem was that my greedy deck uh, post-partial Paris wasn't giving me opening hands that I could consistently, you know, do things with quickly enough to be relevant in any particular game, uh, then the solution was to, you know, be a little bit more linear with my focus and to jam in a lot more lands, because it's a five-color deck, like I said. So I, <laughs> I ramped up to 47 lands, and I made the whole idea of the deck, you know, uh, these extra land effects like Azusa or Exploration or Oracle of Moldiah. And the deck did successfully play a lot of lands, make a lot of mana, but it was kind of a, a bridge to nowhere. We didn't know exactly what we were doing with it. So, in preparation for last weekend's Grand Prix DC, I put in ways to actually win games, and it did. This deck went undefeated once again, and I am excited to show you the post-partial Paris version of competitive now, now Progena Giggles rather than Chromat, and I guess I should tell you why I switched to Progenitus. The idea with Chromat was that you know, we just play the most no-name-ish five-color commander so that people you know, either underestimate us or at least don't have any idea what we're getting at. But what I've decided is that Progenitus is a better lark. It's a better bluff. People think they know what we're doing with Progenitus as our commander, particularly when we're ramping as hard as we do. It looks like we're trying to ramp into, you know, white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green, um, when instead we're just trying to ramp into enough mana to, you know, fire off some sort of a combo. So that's uh, point number one. And point number two is that in a pinch, you know, if uh, someone has sacrificed their mind slicer and we've discarded our hands and just have nothing, um, Progenitus is a genuine uh, win condition in a, a grindier. It's, 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 like a, it's like a plan C, I would say. We don't ever want to have to resort to that, but we can now. We're all shuffled up. Let's draw an opening hand here. See how we like it? We got. Hmm. Hmm. We can't keep this. The only lands that we have don't match the colors of the spells that we have. So I uh, set that aside, draw seven more. So this one has all of the mana in the world and nothing to do with it. We do get a scry and we can scry a couple of times. I, I think we have to go to six here. All right, so we'll set that aside. We'll go to six. This hand really speaks to you know the changes I've made to the deck. The Pongify is what makes me so comfortable. I'm not doing anything right away, but I know that I have at least a, a, a little bit of leverage in dealing with whatever my opponents hypothetically might be doing to make the game last long enough for me to you know get something that gives me some kind of an edge. Like I don't have a Karoo, so the Crows and Restore isn't as strong as it might be, but by the time we cast it, we, we, we might have drawn into one. And the Time Warp, again, nothing in our hand just yet indicates what quite we're gonna do with it, but the Pongify buys us time. Turn one, I'm going to scry one. We have an island. I'm gonna put that on bottom. We run, what, 43 lands? Is that what I said? We uh, can reasonably assume we're going to not miss land drops before. Uh, 
uh, it really matters. And we're gonna draw a Lay Druid. Okay, extra ramp, not so bad. I'm just gonna play a Steam Vents tapped for turn one, and then we'll pass. We'll move on to turn two here. We'll draw another card, a Pact of Negation. Not bad to have that extra bit of utility. At this point, I'm going to put a Stomping Ground into play tapped. I'm going to assume we don't need to fire off our Pongify just yet, or <laughs> fall on our sword with a Pact of Negation, and I will move on to turn three here. We'll draw another land like I thought we might. Uh, I think here we play a Command Tower, and for three, we drop in a Lay Druid. We'll move on to turn four. We're not doing as much as we normally like to, but this deck kind of exponentially explodes. Right on cue, we draw a Demonic Tutor. This is a very skill-testing deck with, you know, a very complex kind of decision trees. I'm having a hard time here making up my mind as to whether it's better to cast my Crows and Restorer and hold up mana for a Pongify or fire off a Demonic Tutor also holding up mana for Pongify. And if I do fire off the Demonic Tutor, I'm having a hard time thinking of what I should grab with it. I think the more conservative play is actually to fire off um, the Demonic Tutor in case there's some kind of a board wipe. We don't want to lose both of our untappy mana uh, dorks. Okay, I edited around how much time it took me to decide that I am going to grab a future site because we need a little more card advantage going on. We're guaranteed to be able to cast it, assuming that no one deals with our Lay Druid next turn, and it sets us up for a pretty enormous turn six, potentially firing off the time warp there if need be. Not to mention that enchantments are just generally kind of hard to deal with for our opponents. So um, we'll play a land for turn, and at the end, or during our opponent's turn, let's assume that we do have to use our Pongify. We're getting to the point where they might be playing some serious threats. So moving right along to turn five here, we will untap, we will upkeep draw, we get a land, that's fine, I suppose. Um, I'm gonna say for one, two, three, four, five, I will drop the future site. I will reveal a forest. I think we would rather play that is our land for turn, just to filter, get extra card advantage, and reveal a Seer's Sundial. Very interesting. We got our pants down a little bit, but we do have a Pact of Negation um, just in case. Hopefully opponents don't see us as the primary threat, though, and they're kind of going after each other, because what are we doing? We're ramping, we're future sight, we're down to four cards in hand. Eh, probably uh, an ostensible bigger threat threat, right? That big turn six I advertised might wind up being a big turn seven instead. It depends on how this draw goes. We'll draw a Seer Sundial revealing, okay, a Gruel Turf. That makes it more likely we might fire it off this turn. We're going to play this as our land for turn. We're going to float um, a green, I suppose, and we're going to return this to our hand, revealing, oh goodness, well, we might just win right here. I need to do some bookkeeping here. It is turn six, forgot about that, and I have one green mana floating right there. This is a little bit awkward, actually, because it broadcasts to the whole table that, you know, we might have infinite next turn, so suddenly, you know, we look like a pretty big threat. Uh, all the while, the Karoo we have doesn't tap for blue, so we don't have infinite of any color of mana. Um, huh. Obviously, I don't know what our hypothetical opponents would be up to right now, but I think on average, the best play um, would be for, you know, one, two, plus the one we have floating for three, we cast uh, the Crozen Restorer, and then for one, two, three, four, we cast uh, our Seer Sundial, just make these sort of little value plays. And I think we do assume at this point that there are red flags going off for our opponents and that we do have to protect ourselves with a Pact of Negation. So during our turn seven, gotta bust out the bigger die here. We will untap, upkeep trigger. We will make sure we pay one, two, blue, blue, five, I guess like that. We will not lose the game to our Pact of Negation. Um, and <laughs> we will draw a Freed from the Real, revealing a Polluted Delta. That is interesting. I think we're at a point where it does make sense to fire off the Time Warp. So the way that's going to look, first we're going to play the Polluted Delta, revealing Dark Petition. That's actually pretty interesting. Seer Sundial triggers. We're not going to pay two because we don't have enough mana, I don't think. Dark Petition might change things. I need to think about this. I've thought about it, and I don't think there's a way to shoehorn in the Dark Petition to, you know, good use. I think that we're about one mana short of doing that. So instead, I'm going to crack the Polluted Delta, and we're going to grab you know, some sort of an island shock land, and we're going to, you know, take the shock on it. Three life. If I had more money, it would be a duel, but, you know, life is a resource, right? Grab a breeding pool. How about? Polluted Delta should be in my graveyard, not my hand. I should reveal a new top card. Oh, that was, uh, ooh, oh, that, does that change anything? 
<laughs> this is excellent news. I think that I can cast Azusa from the top, play these two extra land drops, and that'll leave me with exactly five for the time warp, right? I go one, two, three, four off of this. Um, we'll leave, say, a, a, a green floating. I will cast Azusa, revealing a Psych Rift, whatever. Um, then I will play second land drop for turn, um, third land drop for turn, Bloodstained Mire. Um, I'm going to crack the Bloodstained Mire, or whatever. We're gonna take another shock because life's a resource. Let's say a Watery Grave. That has some black in it. It'll shuffle us up again. We get a new top card. A new top card will be a Thousand Year Elixir. Whatever, that's fine. We have one floating, two, three, four, five. Then we cast a Time Warp. We have an extra turn. So this is still turn seven. We untap. We upkeep, and this is this is what it feels like to play this deck. I have a strong hunch that I, I, we can win the game this turn. I just don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what is going to be underneath this thousand year elixir, but I I, th I think it'll, it'll probably be pretty good. Maybe we, there's a chance that we'll just run out of gas right off the top, but we got Azuzo, we got Future Sight. I, 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 I'm optimistic. So we know what our draw is, thousand year elixir. Now this is the mystery. Big money, big money, no whammies, no whammies, and... Okay, Azorius Chancery, that's good. I'm gonna say that's good news. We're going to play this as our first land for turn. We have a bounce trigger on the stack, but this is revealed, and we can't have another land. Um, in response to the bounce trigger, I'm going to tap a forest, and I am going to tap, I guess, um, a stomping ground to pay for the Seer Sundial trigger to draw a card. We're going to draw the Temple Garden. We're going to reveal a Simic Growth Chamber. Okay, I will return the forest to my hand, and then I will play probably a second land for turn. It's going to be a Simic Growth Chamber revealed as a state base. God, yeah, God, the stupid lands. Okay, all right, all right, making me nervous. Trigger on Seer's Sundial once again. I'm gonna pay one, two for it um, to draw this card, revealing a new card on top. Why, 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 why? Then <laughs> bounce the uh, stopping ground back to my hand off of the cement growth chamber. I've got to think about this. So at this point, and I probably should have recognized this before I played that second land drop there, I do have infinite green and infinite white mana available. All I have to do um, to get that online is let's say uh, for one, two, and three, whatever, I will um, drop the Freed from the Reel on Crows and Restore, and all we need to do is get one more card in our graveyard. We have one, two, three, four, five, six in there to activate Threshold, and then I will have infinite mana of every color. But uh, for reasons I already explained, you know, basically I can tap and untap these using the blue every time, netting myself either a white off of the Azorius Chancery or a green off of the Simic Growth Chamber. So um, infinite of those two colors, I will play the Thousand Year Elixir, might as well. And then this is the real moment of truth. This is where we either run out of gas or we don't. I will play my third land drop for turn, revealing on top, oh good, a Diabolic Tutor. We do win the game now. Um, I will pay the two mana off the Seer Sundial to draw the Diabolic Tutor. I will reveal a new card, Time Spiral. Okay, yeah, we definitely win the game now. Uh, let's just actually do it. Um, I'm gonna uh, tap for a black, and then I will use her to Untap this for another black, and then I will use this with the infinite of the green and white floating to untap her, um, and then I will cast a Diabolic Tutor. We're going to search for a Debt to the Deathless. We do have Threshold then. Let's see, there is Debt to the Deathless that is in our hand. Uh, it doesn't really matter what's on top at this point. I will reveal. Cyclone <laughs> keeps making its way to the top somehow. Um, yeah, and so now that we have Threshold, I can tap her to untap three lands. We'll go one, two, and then Command Tower. You know, this is going to net us a white just to untap her with the blue, and then, you know, we get infinite mana of every color. We cast a Debt to the Deathless after bouncing all of our opponent's permanents to their hands, and then we run out of gas there. But uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, we did it. We did it, guys. Yeah. Yay, and we cast Progenitus too, woohoo! Uh, the first thing that's really different is that the tutor package has expanded. If we're in all five colors, we might as well take advantage
advantage of the best tutors in every color. And so, you know, mystical tutor, worldly tutor, enlightened tutor, demonic tutor, uh, Limdul's vault is very good because we do a lot um, with uh, sort of top deck manipulation or playing off of the top of our library. So this is doubly good in that sense. Um, Wargate, there are lots of permanents that we want out there, lots of beefy enchantments or just creatures. It, 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 it's utility, it fetches us whatever we happen to be missing. Um, Diabolic Tutor, this is new. It's not as mana efficient, of course, as Demonic Tutor, but it gets us anything. And Bring to Light, this is one that I don't know how I didn't have it in there. As I was editing the deck, I was on the fence as to whether or not to include it. And this card alone won me more games than any other card in the deck. Uh, so I'm glad it's in there. <laughs> um, dark Petition is one example of what makes Bring to Light so good. Bring to Light can be just a Dark Petition, effectively, if we pay Wooberg for it. Um, and Increasing Ambition, this has always been in there. Um, but, you know, it's a tutor for one or a tutor for two from the graveyard, because mana is normally not an object for us. Now, this is 10 tutors. That is 10% of the deck. We no longer pull any of our punches. Probably the biggest change about this build, though, um, is, you know, before the Partial Paris disappeared, we we could be so greedy um, that we could assume we'd be able to combo off before opponents had mana up for answers, they were still building out a board before they were playing threats of their own. We can't really rely on that consistently anymore. So uh, I've included quite a few answers and some of the best answers spanning all of the colors uh, of magic. Pact of Negation is um, obviously good. Any zero casting counter spell is wonderful and particularly when we're trying to protect the combo and there is no next upkeep. It's just a free counter spell then. Um, rapid hybridization and pongify. I would run, you know, swords or path, um, except we are very heavy in blue. This is basically a blue green deck splashing the other three colors. Um, Arcane denial, just another good, efficient counter spell that's not too particularly mana intensive, just one blue. Um, Cyclonic rift just isn't auto included in any deck that can run it. Um, and then we have my three, in my opinion, the three best removal spells in the game. We we have Chaos Warp, we have Oblation, and we have Beast Within. Chaos Warp and Beast Within hit any permanent. Oblation hits any non-land permanent, so just any sort of problem that opponents have out there, these deal with um, for a drawback that's not very intense in EDH, as I'm sure you know. And then finally, um, I run Bant Charm, just because it has green and blue in it, which are our two primary colors in this deck. Um, so we can normally hit the extra white fairly straightforwardly. It, it, it is a little mana intensive. There might be some early game moments where we're sitting on this and it's a little awkward because we can't cast it, but the utility is hard to argue with. We can either counter an instant spell to protect one of our combos, or we can put a problem creature on the bottom of its owner's library or destroy an artifact. Those three modes are <laughs> incredibly relevant in any game of Commander. The last version of this had no answers. This version has nine, uh, which you know, isn't enough to classify it as a combo control build, but it's enough to make sure that the game lasts long enough that we get a chance to fire off some scary spells. So we have more tutors and more removal spells. That means we had to cut some things, and uh, the most obvious place to start was with our mana base. The last build, you'll remember, ran 47 lands, including all 10 of the Karoos, which are effectively, you know, two land drops in one. So we, we cut some of that. Now we run 43. That only freed up four spots, so we, we we cut some other things too, but these are all lands that are pretty straightforward. Command Tower, Exotic Orchard, Reflecting Pool, just really good in any five color deck. We run the five fetch lands that were printed most recently, all 10 of uh, the shock lands, just for f fixing. More unique to this deck, stop me if you've heard this before, we run all 10 of the Ravnica Karoos, lands that, you know, come into play tapped and bounce another land back to our hand when they enter the battlefield because they tap for two mana, not just one. Um, those synergize very nicely with the scry lands. I did cut um, a, a couple of the Scrylands. The last build ran all 10. Um, this one I think runs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We run eight. Um, because once I have one Scryland on the battlefield coupled with the Karoos, I can normally get as much value out of it as I need to by bouncing it to my hand and playing it again and bouncing it to my hand and playing it again. But it, 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 it's still nice to have a bunch. <laughs> and this is all, you know, disproportionately important in this deck because, you know, like I hinted before and like we'll get to in a minute, um, we do a lot of top deck manipulation and control with, you know, Sensei's Divining Top, Future Sight, uh, Oracle of Moldiah, etc. Halimar Depths is good for the same reason that the Scrylands are good. It also synergizes with Scrylands. If there's a card we don't want on top, we can, you know, put it there and then scribe to the bottom if we have an extra land drop that happens to be a Scryland, blah, blah, blah. Um, I also run four basics, uh, two islands and two four 
forests just because um, we're heavy in blue-green, like I said. And uh, if someone paths one of our creatures or um, casts a, a, a group huggy sort of ramp spell that lets everyone search for a basic, we want to make sure that we have at least something that we can grab. And then we have two utility lands. Um, casting Wolf Run is a, a pseudo win condition if you know other things fail. And Besaju, this is new actually, um, but it makes a lot of sense. We're trying to cast big, bombastic, combo -y spells, and if we can protect them by making them uncounterable, right? Casting a time stretch with this, for example, is not half bad. Not to mention we run a ton of mana dorks that untap lands. So if we can, you know, get two uses out of this in one turn or three, maybe all the better. This is still absolutely <laughs> a, a, a lands deck, but I, I have cut down on some of the land-based utility. I only have at this point Amulet of Vigor, um, Exploration, Azusa Lost But Seeking, and Oracle of Moldiah. The idea is that if we don't draw into these or have them in our opening hand, um, that you know, we run enough tutors now that we can just sort of fetch them up. I, I cut, for example, Burgeoning. It's a great card, except this deck is focused on having really enormous main phases. We don't care to be doing that much during our opponent's turns, other than, you know, firing off um, our suite of removal spells, but um, it's c c kind of a non-bow, particularly with the extra turn effects that you're going to see in a minute. I mentioned at the beginning whoa, of this video <laughs> the concept of multiplicative ramp rather than simple additive ramp, and I'm going to show you the first half of that equation right now. It's these dorks that untap lands. I've talked about them a little bit here. Uh, Magus of the Candelabra, Voyaging Seder, Kiora's Follower, Thousand Year Elixir isn't a dork, but you know, it does the same thing. Um, Lay Druid, Crows and Restore, Argothian Elder, Fate Stitcher, Stone Cedar, Hierophant. Um, and brief aside, if you want to know where the bubble is for this deck between cards that make the cut and cards that don't, um, it's, it is Lay Druid. This is the last card that I crammed in. It's just a three drop that taps to untap a land. It's a one, one. There is a clone of Lay Druid. They're, they're, like Juniper Ordered Druid does the exact same thing, but I, I didn't put this one in and I did put this. I couldn't justify having two. Uh, and the only reason is I, I like the art on this one a little bit better. This is just, you know, I don't know, doesn't conform to the style guide as well. So typically when you think of, say, a, a voyaging satyr, you think, okay, for two mana, I'm going to have basically one extra mana on each of my turns, but I run all 10 of the Ravnica Karoo, so already it's, you know, twice as much ramp as you're really paying for in its mana cost. But when I say multiplicative, what I mean is that that one untap doesn't just add with these effects that make lands tap for more mana, it really kind of multiplies. If I, you know, enchant a land, a, a Karoo with a market festival, suddenly that single land taps for four mana. And if I untap it with this Voyaging Seder, I'm getting eight mana off of one land in one turn just from, you know, these two ramp effects that, you know, kind of multiply with each other rather than simply add with each other. Does that make sense? That said, for this version, I did wind up cutting a wild growth just because with these enchant lands, I'm not just looking for multiplicative ramp. I'm also looking for color fixing and, and just getting an extra green didn't quite cut it. Though the value is there for one mana if, if we weren't in five colors, absolutely. But all, all I have are um, fertile ground, two mana taps for one additional of any color. Verdant Haven, three mana does the same thing, but gains us two life. The two life really isn't relevant. It's just another less efficiently costed fertile ground basically. And then uh, Market Festival and Dawn's Reflection are effectively clones of each other. They both make uh, the Enchanted Land Tap for two additional mana in any combination of colors. The idea is, you know, we only have four, sure, but same as kind of, um, you know, these extra land drop effects, we can tutor for them if need be. Often we'll just draw into them organically, though four is still a lot, even in a 100 card deck. I of course run ways to draw extra cards. Not a whole lot has changed on this front. Frantic Search is great in any deck. It's a free way to loot twice, um, but in a deck that has lands that tap for more than just one mana, it's effectively a blue dark ritual. It's really great. Seer's Sundial, if we're making extra land drops every turn with mana to burn, it just keeps our hand full. Um, Plea for Power is strong. Factor Fiction is strong. Intellectual Offering, same basic logic as Frantic Search if 
we have a, a mana dork out that untaps a land that might happen to be bestowed with, uh, you know, Dawn's Reflection. It's effectively free, or at least costs a lot less. Um, Recurring Insight. This one is new. I don't know why. I should have included it the whole time. I swapped out Stroke of Genius, because Stroke of Genius is a non-bow with Possibility Storm, which I haven't gotten to, but is still in the deck, actually. Um, I mean, th this card often just wins us the game outright, particularly if we have an extra turn effect and enough mana to cast uh, that on top of this. Um, and Time Spiral, again, I mean, same basic logic as Frantic Search. We're often getting more mana out of the untap than we used to cast the spell initially, and it throws our opponents off of their game plan by making them shuffle their hands and graveyards back into their libraries, and refills our hand. I mean, you, usually, I don't know if usually, but often this card uh, effectively reads, just go ahead and win the game right now. <laughs> okay, Sensei's Divining Top. I understand that a lot of decks run this card, but often I feel like it's just kind of crammed into a deck because very few decks are worse for having it, but uh, this deck in particular really uses the crap out of this. You know, running eight of the scry lands, we can often filter so that the card that's on top is one we don't want, and then scry it to the bottom to just get extra sort of filtering value out of it. Um, and also it synergizes, I talked about this last time, with Future Sight, I also run Magus of the Future, these sorts of effects. Basically, if we have a Future Sight in play, we can tap draw the top card of our library, pay one mana, cast the top again, tap, draw the top card of our library, put it on top, pay one to cast it again. We're paying one colorless mana to draw a card. Hard to argue with that value. Future Sight naturally synergizes with effects that give us extra land drops for turn. We can go spell, spell, land, spell, spell, land, spell, land, spell, spell off of the top without, you know, running out of gas, as it were. And um, Possibility Storm, I just referenced this card. <laughs> its synergy with Future Sight is so fun, it's great. Possibility Storm only triggers when we cast from our hand, so if we're casting from the top of our library, we're still playing a pretty normal game while our opponent's game plan is totally off kilter now. Or alternatively, if we don't like the card that's on top of our library, we can cast a spell from our hand, trigger Possibility Storm, and then we get a new top card randomly. One thing that I didn't mention about Possibility Possibility Storm last time that I, that I think I should is that it's not just in here for the future side combination and it's not just in here as some novelty some gimmick I really think it's a great card for this deck because it effectively changes the game state to one where the player who can a cast the most spells and B has on average the most potent spells in their deck is going to benefit uh, disproportionately and I think in most pods that's us right we have tons of mana at our disposal by the time that we're dropping this and, uh, you know, we're in five colors, so we're only playing really good, potent spells that forward our pretty linear game plan in, in some way, shape, or form, no matter what we trip into. This locks opponents out of their game plans without affecting our game plan all that much. Also, the synergy with Jeskai Ascendancy is real, because <laughs> um, Jeskai Ascendancy triggers once when we cast the initial spell from our hand, and again when we cast um, whatever spell we trip into with Possibility Storm. So we get two untaps of our dorks. If we have a Karoo that's enchanted with a Market Festival, say, we could often make pseudo-infinite mana. The biggest difference between this build and the you know partial Paris build is that I have cut a whole bunch of extra turn effects. The idea, you know, way back when was that you know we would hit a, a relatively efficiently costed extra turn effect and just kind of loop into you know an extra turn card, draw into another extra turn card, and play another and another and another. Um, I, I've cut it way down. I have these two, Time Warp and Temporal Mastery. This one largely because um, it synergizes very well with Mystical Tutor. <laughs> these don't exactly win us the game all on their own, except at a certain point, we're at a critical mass where they kind of do, right? If we have a mana dork that untaps a land, that taps for four mana with a future sight and an Azusa in play, you know, casting one of these will probably be um, all we need to finish it. But in case one extra turn isn't enough for you, why not take two, right? Mana is no object. We can hit 10 pretty easily, often backing it up with an Arcane Deny or a you know, Pact of Negation. Or if two isn't enough for you, you know, why not just take infinite? You know, once we reach a critical mass of mana, Mana, we can cast a time stretch. Maybe we'll have enough mana left that turn to cast an Eternal Witness and return this to our hand. Then on the first extra turn, we capsize with buyback the Eternal Witness, and uh, then the next extra turn, we cast the time stretch and we do it all over again. And we're getting extra land drops all the while and drawing extra cards all the while. And eventually, we, we just wait. I mean, we win. We win. We win. Failing that, as long as we have a Ravnica Karu that taps for blue and something else and a way to untap that land, if we draw into a 
freed from the real or tutor from a free for, 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 for. tutor for a freed from the real we uh, e equip no we, we enchant the voyaging satyr um, and then we tap this for blue green then we tap the voyaging satyr to untap this we use the blue to untap the Voyaging Seder, and we're netting a green every time. So that's infinite green mana. Um, then if we have Staff of Domination, we can use that infinite green mana to draw our deck and untap this as many times as we want, even without the Freed from the Real, getting us infinite mana of every color. Or we don't even need the Staff of Domination if we have, say, a Market Festival enchanted on that land, because then we can net, you know, blue, blue every time, and then get infinite untaps and untap as many lands as we want. Um, so we, we, we draw our deck somehow, either with the Staff of Domination or with Sensei's Divining Top Future Sight or, you know, just with Future Sight. Um, and the eventual win condition is usually a debt to the Deathless. We just make our opponents lose infinite times to life. And we gain that much. Thanks a bunch for watching. Uh, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think of the deck. If there's any obvious card that's not like over $100 that I should be including in here. And um, uh, if you've been enjoying Pokeback Gaming's content as of late, um, I would encourage you to do a couple of things. One, I have a, a, a main channel. It's a more political channel focusing on the 2016 presidential election from a pretty progressive point of view, full disclosure. Um, so there's a, I'll, put a, I'll put a link over in the, uh, in the side over, well, it's gonna be that direction. Um, and also, um, if you wanna support my YouTube endeavors on Patreon. It's a crowdfunding platform that helps make sure um, I'll be able to keep making these tech 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 techs for you and other wonderful new media, magic related and non-magic related things. Uh, anyway, thanks as always. Uh, bye. <laughs>